Already, Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, our session today is a summer state of mind, school tested equity and ed tech strategies. And uh, before we launch into the presentation, I'm just going to go through a few housekeeping items uh, for this session. So firstly, today's event will be around an hour long and we'll also be recording it. Uh, so it gives you flexibility uh, if you have to jump. Uh, we'll also email you the link of the recording uh, so you can watch it again, share it with any colleagues, uh, review anything that you missed. Uh, secondly, uh, for this session, if you could please disable any pop-up blockers that you have uh, to ensure that you can view the slides easily. Uh, thirdly, uh, this is an interactive session and we'd really love any questions you have. Uh, you can send through the Q&A tool or just any thoughts that you'd like to share with uh, fellow viewers, um, myself and the panelists. Uh, next, if you would like to enlarge uh, the slides on your screen, uh, you can do so by dragging them to the corner of the box. Uh, this will allow you to make them smaller or larger, depending on what device uh, you're dialing in from. And there's also uh, widgets around it, so you can move it around, uh, so that way you can get the most of your desktop uh, space as well. And then finally, if there are any uh, technical diff difficulties that you have during the webinar uh, that I haven't covered. Uh, you can clear your cache and refresh your browser. Uh, that should uh, that should help with it. And if that doesn't work, uh, feel free to reach out in the Q and A uh, as well. Want to make sure you can uh, join us uh, from wherever you are. Okay, awesome. So. Uh, hi, everyone, again. Uh, my name is Madeleine Mortimer, and I'm the Global Education Innovation and Research Lead at Logitech. I focus on building uh, the best products possible to make as much impact as we can within the classroom from both the student side, educator side, uh, learning environments. My background is in education. I taught in the classroom, and I have my master's degree focus on ed tech uh, from the Harvard Graduate School of Education. And I'm really excited to apply that knowledge uh, to the work that we're doing at Logitech. I'm so excited about the panelists we have uh, here today. And uh, firstly, I'd love uh, Dr. Hemphill, if you could introduce yourself to the viewers. And also uh, to kick us off, I'd love to hear uh, what your summer state of mind is. So what's top of mind for you this summer? Absolutely. Good afternoon. Thank you so much, Madeline. It is a pleasure to be here to have this conversation. My name is Dr. Mary Hemphill. I am a leadership development coach and chief academic officer for the state of North Carolina. And I love that question about a summer state of mind. I was talking to a friend the other day and I said, I have just become so hungry to learn about what this future of education is going to look like. And not the revolution, because at the re at the end of a revolution, we lose people, right? We don't want to lose our teachers and our students and this exciting opportunity we have to innovate. So I'm excited to become a learner of the evolution. I have been voraciously just devouring books and listening to podcasts and thought leaders and panels such as this so that I can better understand what's happening across our globe what's happening specifically in our state when it comes to ed tech and the evolution of teaching and learning. So I'm just super excited to be here today and to engage with Matt and yourself, Madeline. So thank you. Thank you so much. I love that. A learner of the evolution. That's so powerful. And yes, our other uh, panelists, uh, Matt, we'd love to hear uh, from you, your background, and also what your summer state of mind is. Great. First off, I wanted to thank both both of you. It's going to be great presenting with you today. I've been looking forward to this. Um, my name's uh, Matt Highfield. Uh, I'm called Matthew if I'm in trouble, so um, you can call me Matt in the chat if you have a question for me, unless I'm in trouble. Uh, I'm a longtime social studies teacher and for 25 years, and recently I've been working as a social studies curriculum specialist. At, um, a digital curriculum specialist. And I would say um, six or seven years ago, we really started into integrating laptops in our classroom. 
started noticing um, a concrete digital divide. And that it was pretty simple at the start. And that was, you know, some students didn't have connectivity and others did, and that was a barrier. But we soon found it was much more nuanced than that. Um, first off, um, it was type of connectivity um, that was making a difference. There, because there's many different types of inadequate connectivity at home. But then, um, more importantly, um, to speak to Mary's point, there's kind of an evolution going on, and we were looking at digital divides, plural, and, and a lot of that had to do with opportunities and what students were learning about in the classroom and how they were being instructed. So it wasn't just connectivity, but it was also pedagogy and, and how students were being able to uh, work with technology. And I would say my summer state of mind is uh, similar to Mary's. I am excited about the evolution and the possibilities that EdTech can, can offer our students. You know, EdTech, when implemented well, can empower and it can get, engage students. It can um, amplify voices. And then um, when it's not implemented well, it sometimes can punish our poorest and most vulnerable students. And so that's the challenge of evolution to make sure that the integration of EdTech is as inclusive as possible. That's such a fantastic point that you brought up, Matt, that now with the increase in one-to-one -one devices, um, we're really seeing the equity issue beyond just connectivity. And in this session, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to really take a step back and see how we can set up EdTech, integrate EdTech, uh, that it's applied in equitable ways. Uh, and the three the three main areas uh, that we're going to walk through as it pertains to that is uh, firstly, expression of knowledge, uh, secondly, engagement with content, and lastly, connection with others. So really excited for this uh, discussion today. So let's dive straight in. Uh, let's start with uh, expression. So we, we've seen expression um, be a really powerful tool uh, within the classroom. And now it's really seeing how can this continue to be integrated now that we have one-to-one -one devices and a lot more uh, device-centered learning. Uh, so the first question, which I'd love uh, to firstly hear from uh, Dr. Hempel is uh, what strategies have you used uh, to encourage all students to speak up and share their opinions, even in a learning environment where there's uh, many one-to-one -one devices? Absolutely. I love this question because it really causes us to step back and become reflective practitioners. So I usually try to start with a standard, whether I'm working with teacher leaders or school leaders, I start with that standard and then I ask them, what are the on-ramps and off-ramps that we have right now for students to use ed tech to access this standard, to respond to this standard, or be assessed in this standard? I absolutely love what Matt just said. When we do ed tech incorrectly, we're polarizing, we're further polarizing those students who may already be struggling learners, struggling readers, or have a relationship with tech that they are still exploring. So using that specific strategy-based approach to say, okay, if this is an English language arts lesson or a math lesson or a social studies lesson, what are the on-ramps that we can utilize when it comes to ed tech to think about how students can access? Do we have a learning management system that can introduce them to the concept? Do we want to use in-classroom tablets for us to project and screen share? Do we want to use online con content delivery model? Whatever those on-ramps are, then really looking at our students and saying, do our students have access and connectivity that is secure and resourceful? Do we have an opportunity for one-on-ones or small groups so that students who are already expressing lots of proclivities and proficiency with that particular ed tech, lift them up as the experts, allow them to peer coach, peer teach. And then maybe you have specific subgroups that may be struggling. What if you have one teacher in the building who were doing amazing things with ed tech with that subgroup? 
well, let's get rid of the brick and mortar or the teacher of record and transcend that teacher leader to help other teacher leaders train and teach. It removes the excuse that this ed tech doesn't work for our students, but it also helps us assess better and ensure that more students are gonna have equitable access based on the standards that we're trying to teach and the content that we're trying to help them master. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's so powerful, especially integrating student voice into uh, how they want to best use it and giving that choice in terms of the learning environment. And it's very true, once you have the right tools in place, you can have those small groups, the one-on-ones, it really opens up all of those avenues. Mm -hmm. And I'd love to build upon that uh, slightly with Matt. And I'd love to hear if you have heard about how schools are getting feedback directly from the students in terms of what type of tech they they would uh, want to use, how they're feeling about different tools that allow them to express their knowledge in different ways. Sure. Um, I would say that in the classroom, um, teachers who are observant are constantly noticing what is what is engaging their students and what might not be. In our district, we sur survey our students as well. Um, mm. And in the resource center for our, our listeners, I put two links. One is to our district survey that surveys parents, teachers, and students at all levels. And there are some questions about technology. And there's also a speak up survey that we use that we just started using this year, which also has questions about technology use. And that kind of helps us frame frame how our students are experiencing technology because there's open-ended responses too. And the feedback we've gotten is has been really helpful. So figuring out a way as we move forward and to evaluate that evolution that Mary was talking about, getting feedback um, at a district-wide level, in addition to you know the observations, um, the qualitative observations of practitioners in the classroom, that's how we're finding out uh, how our our students are experiencing ed tech and what we can do better. That's really powerful. Gathering voices from multiple different angles, both from the educator standpoint, the observation, as well as the student voice. Um, that's yeah to get. Both of those viewpoints, I can imagine you get very holistic, comprehensive feedback uh, to better integrate ed tech. Okay, awesome. And a final question on this topic, and I'd love to hear from both of your uh, expertise and experiences on this one. Uh, so how can we shift our ed tech usage or applications in ways that reduce barriers to expression for historically marginalized students. So I'd love to hear from both of you uh, on this one. Absolutely, Madeline. I'll, I'll jump in here. Really, when we think about ed tech, one of the conversations we have to have as decision makers, whether that is the superintendent, the school leader, teacher leaders, or any of those community stakeholders, is to really look at the piece of ed tech that we're thinking about implementing or thinking about initiating in our schools or in our district and understand that design absolutely matters. When we think about that design, well, sometimes what we might see in the program is that there should be, there might be flaws that disproportionately affect certain populations. So, for example, um, I remember we implemented a particular math program that was supposed to really bridge the gap with literacy and ensuring that our students could solve word problems. Well, as we started to really dive into this piece of software and we started looking at some of the different programs, what we noticed were that the linguistics the language that was utilized in those word problems was so complex that students weren't able to focus on the content. They were getting confused. They didn't understand that some of that vocabulary that we had used in the formal teaching of that word problem did not match what that program was utilizing. So design absolutely matters when we think about acquisition of language and when we think about the protocol that is required sometimes for students just to understand concepts. What we know is that students from historically marginalized populations, students from lower socioeconomic populations, they start in kindergarten a lot of times based on the research 
at a deficit of 30,000 words. So when we think about how to transcend ed tech for English language arts, math, science, and social studies, we have to really look at how are these programs understanding bridging that gap? Are we further polarizing these students to be less successful when it comes to that design? And are we asking ourselves the critical questions that need to be asked? For instance, is someone on that team going to log in as a student, go through all of the programming, understand what that feedback looks like? If you have a student who is historically marginalized and has struggled through their educational career, they need feedback at different guideposts and different places in that ed tech experience. If that student goes through the program and then at the end, let's say there's 10 questions and they only get one right, but they only find out at the end that they got a one out of 10 or a 10% correct, they're going to be less likely to engage. They're going to disengage from the experience because again, it's sort of set up that low hanging expectation. So design matters ask the critical questions and always before adopting anything, put yourself in the seat of the learner who is going to be interacting with that software or with that ed tech tool. That's so perfect. And I love what you said about going through the steps yourself of what the student will actually experience and not leaving room for assumption around that, which is definitely easy to do when we're designing either ed tech uh, tools or programs. And yeah, that's that's really powerful process. And we'd love to hear from your perspective as well, Matt. Well, I wanted to say that I really appreciate that answer as well in going through the student perspective. Several years ago, I was working with a student, helping them. I'm a social studies teacher. I, I was looking at um, some physics homework that they were working on. And the question was, about velocity, but it was about skiing in a chairlift. And this was a student who he was an English language learner, but had never been on a chairlift or been skiing. And so it, it really made no sense to them. And it was, so it was, it was just another barrier. And I don't think the teacher was doing that on purpose. It was just one of those things where maybe they didn't take the extra step of taking it as a student would take it. And, and walking in their shoes. So, so that's, that's a really uh, important, important practice that Mary pointed out. I was just going to add that as far as um, reducing barriers for historically marginalized students, I would, I would make the case that engaging the whole family in the process is critically important. And once again, in, in your resource center, I provided two examples of that. One, in my school district, we have parent outreach tech nights where we teach parents uh, of historically marginalized students, families, um, the technology that the students are using and how to access um, grades and attendance and all those, all those things that are part of the school ecosphere um, and how to, how to access from, from their phones many Many parents don't necessarily have computers at home, so working with what working with what they have. Mm -hmm. During COVID, we also had an apartment outreach project. It was an outdoor event in which we were helping parents understand how to how to access and how to help their students because is uh, the world, our nation, everyone was going online, and so we needed to give those. Resources. So we worked with an apartment complex, with our with our um, counseling department, um, with our tech team to figure out where there was the most concentration of families that were in need, and 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 that was a very positive experience. So I would say that trying to reach out um, to parents and families directly where they're at. Sometimes parents can't make it to school. Sometimes it's far away. Sometimes they might not have transportation. So just trying to be creative and to offer opportunities uh, for parents for parents to learn along with their students. Because when, when parents are empowered, they, they're more likely to help their students as well. That's a really fantastic example, especially around being intentional around how we implement ed tech and not just 
know, dumping it in the classroom and saying, off you go. It's really taking that holistic, intentional approach uh, we've seen uh, have the most impact when we're using this type of technology. So fantastic examples. Okay, fantastic. So let's move on to the second uh, main area that we're discussing today. Uh, which is around engagement. So I know this term is used, overused, and <laughs> somewhat becomes uh, white noise. But we'll, we're re what we're really looking uh, is engagement from uh, equity standpoint. So looking at uh, everything from virtual tours, uh, maker spaces, interactive textbooks, and what type of technology can really enhance all of those uh, different activities and not just be complacent uh, using the device by itself. Mm -hmm. So let's go into the first question. Uh, so we'd love to go uh, with Matt uh, to start with. Uh, so do you have any grounding philosophies in how schools should deploy ed tech uh, to support student engagement? Sure, I love this question. I would, I would say uh, a framework for me is uh, three things, creativity, collaboration, and connection. And I'll just start with creativity. When you're thinking about employing ed tech, I think about students coming home to their parent or guardians and the parent or guardian saying, well, what are you excited about learning? And I would, I would be willing to bet that the student answers, whether they're in second grade or 10th grade or 12th grade, that it has something to do with creativity. And I don't think a student is going to say, I'm really excited about uh, filling out this worksheet. Uh, what, they will, what they will tend to share, I mean, if you think about a young person in your life and you ask them this question, I think they will tend to share something that they've had a choice it allows them to amplify their own voice and allows them to own own their own learning. I would also say with respect to ed tech that collaboration is a key piece. When students are allowed to work together, I mean, that it isn't always the case that you can do that, but when students are allowed to work together, to partner, to work collaboratively, there's just a different type of energy in class. And I'll just give you this brief example. Um, a couple of years ago, I was walking in a high school and I walked by one class and I looked in and the whole class was looking at their computers and it was very quiet from a classroom management standpoint. It looked like, wow, this, this teacher has it dialed in. And I looked closely and I wasn't convinced that all the students were on task. Maybe they were at different websites doing different things, um, maybe not related to the curriculum, but from an outsider's point of view, it looked like it was a very quiet, quiet classroom. And then I walked to a nearby classroom and there was a lot more noise and energy and students were in small groups. They were kind of debating. They had their technology. They were looking up things, looking up resources and creating a presentation, but there was a buzz in the classroom. And from an outsider's point of view, you could look in and say, wow, it seems, seems kind of noisy and distracting. But if you would walk in that room, you would see that those students were dialed in and on task. So uh, collaboration and shared learning, I would say, is an important part of EdTech. And then finally, I'll just say uh, connection. And when, when I say connection, I'm thinking about how students are um, experiencing their assessments. And I've seen some of the most successful assessments happen when people besides the teacher in addition to the teacher are allowed to uh, to look at what the students are doing. And that could be a fellow teacher, a parent, a vice principal. Um, it could be um, a school board, just a really an authentic audience. When I'm talking about connections, I'm talking about using ed tech in a way that allows for authentic audiences. And certainly through COVID and the pandemic, I think, uh, people all over have gotten more familiar with using Zoom and being able to interact. And that's, that's been um, a, a positive aspect 
um, amidst amidst the tragedy of COVID, it's been positive that people have been more comfortable in exploring resources outside of the classroom using EdTech. That's a really great example, Matt, of what you mentioned around, you know, you pass the classroom and everyone's on their one-to-one -one devices and you know dialed in but doesn't necessarily mean engagement uh, but when you have the right tools it can enable students to engage in different ways i love what you said around the collaboration piece of uh, being able to collaborate with their peers effectively and really engage with the content beyond just consuming it uh, on the device really powerful examples Okay, we'll go on to another question, uh, this one for uh, Dr. Hemphill. And uh, we're gonna go to the question on around uh, teacher development. Uh, so we know summer is a key time uh, per for professional development and mm -hmm. would love to hear your thoughts on how schools can use uh, some of these same strategies to support educators as they learn and engage with professional development throughout the summer? Absolutely. One of my favorite questions, because when I think of instructional leadership, when I think of ed tech leadership, I always want to make sure that we're modeling for teacher leaders and ensuring that the same choice, the same differentiation, the same expectations we have in them creating sort of this model classroom we want to be the models of that with professional development. I can think of back when I was a principal at the elementary, middle, and high school level, when we have schools where teacher leaders are coming in and we're asking them to learn a new ed tech tool, to implement a new ed tech tool, or to monitor how students are engaging, one of the things we like to do is really step back and say, what is our true tech north? What do I mean by that? We have seen over the past two, two and a half, almost three years that the research is telling us that the engagement of teacher leaders and school districts of ed tech tools has increased by over 900 percent. So when we try to find the conversation starters about what ed tech tools we want teachers to master, we were getting so many answers. I have all these ed tech tools that I'm expected to use. I've become okay at some of the implementations, but I haven't mastered any. So when we're working with teacher leaders, we like to say, what's your true tech north? What do I mean by that? What does ex masterful expression look like on this ed tech tool for students in the fourth grade? What does great expression and output look like for this student in the 10th grade with this ed tech tool? And then ensuring that that language is communicated to the teacher which is a specific set of vocabulary, nomenclature, and strategies. That's very different for student leaders. That's very different for school leaders. So we start there. Whether we're working with schools or whether we're working with districts, we establish the True Tech North. Then what we do is we take our teachers and we elevate them as professional experts and thought leaders. In one particular school I, I had the opportunity to lead, it, was, it had been deemed a failing school by the state. We knew that our time was the most precious commodity that we had. So what we used were our observation protocols. And we said, we want in our True Tech North for teachers to master Google Suite, for them to really make sure that they're doing great when it comes to the classroom tablets and whatnot. We have three things. In our observations, we specifically looked for teacher leaders who were doing this on a consistent basis in formal and informal observations. We created badges for each of those ed tech tools. When we saw a teacher who was doing really well at this implementation, really great at monitoring, really great at assessing, they would earn a badge over their door. What that helped us do was remove the excuses again that it can't happen with our students or this demographic, but it also elevated our teacher leaders. Then what we did over the summer as professional development are those teachers who had earned specific badges, we elevated them as the breakout leaders, mm -hmm. as the thought leaders, because other teachers wanted to learn from other teachers in the district or in the school or in the community. And it started conversations. Checklists don't grow teachers, conversations do. And when we could leverage the playing field and say, this teacher is pointed toward our true tech north, 
They understand our demographic. They've mastered this ed tech tool in new and innovative ways with the resources we have right here. It shifted. Not only did teachers learn from other peers, but other teachers were saying, how do I get the badges? How do I? And we started talking to them about consistency and lesson planning, consistency with assessments and monitoring. So creating that internal badging system, but using teachers as the springboard for those conversations, implemented choice, implemented differentiation, and it also allowed us to stay super aligned with what it is that we wanted teachers and students to master together. The other big part of this is overarching the conversation around productive failure had to happen with teachers over the summer as well. So what do I mean by that? When you walk through your school and you start to see teachers engaging with tech and maybe it doesn't work, maybe the bandwidth is not there, maybe the connectivity is not there, how do you support teachers in the failure? Are they penalized? Do you have conversations? Do you help them think tank and connect them with IT? But allowing them to, to really productively fail, still feel good about their big learnings, and adjust accordingly is absolutely something that's going to trickle down. So over the summer, we really infused that idea of productive failure alongside the True Tech North, and we saw much richer engagement, more teachers that wanted to try different things that they hadn't before, but we really were able to narrow that focus and get Those are absolutely wonderful examples. And I love what you were talking about around measuring impact and really having the educators become used to, uh, even if it's just observational, really seeing what's working, uh, what could be adjusted, building that muscle memory. And uh, then secondly, your badge example, I can see how that really helped to bring uh, community to integrating ed tech and just having that peer-to-peer -peer support can be so powerful uh, along that journey uh, that educators go through. Excellent, excellent. So that brings us to our final area that we're going to discuss uh, today, which is around uh, Connect. So in this, in this uh, current summer, uh, we're physically most of us disconnected from our school communities. And so I'd love uh, to hear from Matt, uh, firstly, around how schools can use EdTech on hand uh, to stay connected, whether it's to students, uh, the educator community, uh, parents. Sure, that's great. I just wanted to thank Mary again for that, that answer. I love the idea of productive failure. It, that's a concept that works well in a healthy classroom, and it should be a concept that works well with teachers too. So that's that's really great. As far as um, staying connected over the summer, that that's probably a challenge for all of us. I would say that there's a few things uh, to think about. One is going to where students are with uh, with ed tech opportunities and. Um, our district probably isn't the same as every district, but I would say one of the places where students go, especially our most impacted students go, are to meal programs to, to get uh, a free or reduced lunch. And in the past, we've implemented um, tech learning programs at certain sites or reading and literacy pro programs at certain sites. So it isn't a deficit-based um, event where students and families go to get a meal during the summer. It's an asset-based event where you want to work to develop and to create curiosity um, and skills um, where they're at. So if, you, if there's any way to set up some ed tech opportunities, some learning opportunities at places where, where students go during the summer, I would say that that is a big value add some some districts have communication communication platforms. We happen to have a communication platform that, if we publish a message that goes out to our parents, it's translated into all the languages that we have in our district. So that could potentially be a way to 
make an announcement about opportunities that are going on in um, in the school district, in in the park district, or anything that's that's enriching. Once again, going from um, a deficit-based mentality to an asset-based mentality, and to um, acknowledge the curiosity of all our students and and families. I love that example of providing that space uh, that students, uh, community can really come together and have access to that technology as well during the summer. And we'd love to hear from you as well, uh, Dr. Hempill, on this particular question. Absolutely. I think one of the one of the best ways that schools can really use ed tech that they have on hand is really to go and to ensure that we're piloting with diverse sets of students which is an amazing opportunity to marry not only the di differentiation that we need, but also a marry that idea of summer schooling as well. So when you're able to do that during the summer, put ed tech tools in some of the subgroups that you've looked at that may have struggled a little bit. Maybe they didn't quite make it across the finish line when it comes to mastering some concepts. Utilizing the ed tech you have on hand to augment and give them a very different experience than they had during the formal instructional days is going to give you feedback and it's going to give you insight that you can use to make that school year better. One of my mottos uh, for education is if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. So when you think about the ed tech you have on hand, are there other stakeholders, groups that you haven't connected to? Perhaps I love what Matt said about community engagement and putting it in the hands of our parents and our community members, maybe creating a unlisted YouTube library of those community leaders and parent ambassadors in their language, in their background, in your backyard, talking about how they engage ed tech. Again, this is about leveraging the playing field and not kind of trying to rise above it. But when we ask ourselves who's on the menu, this is also an op awesome opportunity during the summer too, to say, who did we not think about when it came to this one-on-one -on -one initiative? How are we making sure that our McKinney-Vento, our students who are deemed homeless, are we making sure that they're connected and that we're reaching out and leveraging those social workers to have one pagers on what the ed tech resources that are available? What about our parents? Again, as Matt said, with different languages, I love that idea of translating it into all the languages that are represented in your district. It doesn't require you to buy anything new. It doesn't require you to budget for anything new, but it just requires us to think deeply about what we already have on hand so that we can get more data. When we have more data and information, we can make more knowledgeable mm -hmm. decisions. That's such an intriguing idea about using those summer school sessions as mini pilot programs. And I love what you said of making sure those programs, especially when we're treating it like a pilot, really represents the students across the school and different needs that they have uh, that's a really, really great idea. Uh, so going on to one of our last questions of the session, and I'm really excited about uh, this one. I know we could talk about it for hours, <laughs> uh, but we'd love uh, to start again with uh, Dr. Hempill on uh, what does connecting with others using ed tech look like in a dream scenario? So in other words, if you could design a school and a community from the ground up, uh, what type of ed tech would you integrate? Absolutely. So it would definitely be an ed tech utopia where we literally lived and learned and led outside the brick and mortar. One of the things I've seen one of uh, the most innovative districts do is understand that when it comes to parents and teachers and community and that connectedness, that we don't that doesn't always have to happen in the school building. So they partnered with the local YMCA, local rec centers, even a principal who went to football Friday night and set up ed tech stations outside the gate. The utopia would be that we don't say the confines of this building are where our connectedness starts and stops. But yet we're going to find ways around the clock, because again, we're human beings, not human doings. So schooling and learning doesn't just happen from eight to three. It happens at 3.30 and two o'clock in the morning and sometimes midnight. Do they have access in that way where they can learn, 
where they can teach and where they can be assessed outside the clock? Do we have portals within the community? Maybe it's a school bus that has con connected devices into our infrastructure and we park them in parking lots where community members and families who don't have access or great broadband or bandwidth can get on that bus and engage one with another. Do we have teachers who are working, not necessarily outside of the school hours, but thinking differently about how they connect with parents? Maybe we do a flex schedule where parent-teacher conferences don't happen after school, but we find coverage during the school day for teachers to make themselves available in the community and teach parents about that ed tech based on the first, second, or third shift schedule that they might have. So the utopia would be true community, true teachers and learners, and also the fact that teacher leaders don't always have to be the facilitators. Are we baking in durable, employable skills? No longer soft skills. These are durable skills for our students to say, hey, mom, hey, dad, hey, aunt, hey, uncle, hey, grandpa, hey, god, mom. This is an ed tech tool I'm using and then safely protecting them and their identity and everything, of course. But really, are our students becoming ambassadors of this ed tech as well? Because sometimes the learning comes when a student is able to look at that tool and in ways that we sometimes as adults may say, oh, I have so many filters. I don't know how I can innovate this usage. Have we created ideas and opportunities for them to create? and design and assess themselves, and then tell the adult stakeholders what their experiences have been. And I think when we were, if we were able to bring all of those things together, we would see that we're shining a light on just how amazing stakeholdership for students can be and how powerful it can be when parents and community members are engaged in that learning process together. I love this underlying theme uh, that you've both brought up uh, throughout the session around really having that holistic, comprehensive integration and including the entire uh, community, whether it's uh, parents, people at home, educators, students, uh, that holistic approach uh, really seems like the most effective uh, from what I'm hearing from you both. And we'd love to hear from you as well, Ma, on uh, same question what would the dream scenario look like when it comes to connecting others uh, with a tech? <laughs> you know, it's really hard to add to Mary's dream because that was pretty comprehensive. Uh, I, I share, would share the, the same type of vision. It, you, you know, it would start with connectivity that every everyone would have adequate access. And I would go to thinking about design and I would say Traditionally, most schools that I've been involved with in my career, they are welcoming in nature. Uh, when a family comes, you are welcome to learn here. And that's, that's a very good statement. It's a positive statement, but I would like to see the evolution of that statement to be, uh, you're not only welcomed here, but we've designed the system to meet your needs so you can best integrate and be learners and teachers and, you know, be, be valued and heard in our community. Yeah, I love, again, uh, this whole c concept of community and integrating those voices and also being, feeling that sense of belonging as well can be really important, especially when technology, when we don't have the right tools, it can actually be quite isolating uh, learning experience and having that right integration uh, to continue that collaborative, uh, connected feel uh, I'm hearing is really important. Okay, excellent. So that was the final part of our session today. Uh, so what we'll do is now we'll move into some Q&A for our panelists. And so feel free uh, viewers to post your question in the Q&A and we'll get right to it. Uh, so we have first question here. Uh, so this is for Matt. Uh, what advice do you have for educators uh, that are struggling with tech fatigue, uh, but also their students, if their students are struggling with tech fatigue as well? That's a great question. And I think we certainly saw that coming out of COVID. And 
you know, I've talked with several teachers who, who stated, you know, I'm not using technology anymore because I'm tired using technology. My advice would be just think about, um, just thinking of technology as a tool of learning and not the end. There are great lessons that happen without technology and, and those should still be taught. But, but if you use technology as a tool, it can offer great value adds. And so I don't think it's an all or nothing proposition. You don't have to feel guilty about lessons that do not involve technology because if they're great lessons and they're rich relationships that are built. But when used correctly, um, you know, in an enriching sense, technology has a lot of value adds. So in thinking about the question, I would, in thinking about, tech fatigue because during COVID, uh, it was 100% all the time technology. And, and some, of the, some of the lessons teachers were getting used to how to use technology 100% of the time, usually over Zoom. And so it's, it's okay to, uh, you know, be, be really thoughtful in, in how you implement technology. And there are times when technology is a great value add, and there are times when it's okay uh, not to use technology. So mm-hmm. that's how I would address address fatigue. It's not tech is not an all or nothing proposition in the, in the classroom. COVID made it feel that way, but as we as we start to move past that, that's how I would address that question. Yeah, absolutely. Especially when we just put in tech for the sake of tech it causes that extra friction which in turn increases fatigue so being really intentional uh, about how we appropriately integrate it fantastic points Uh, so let's see we have another question uh, that has come in Uh, so can you both share an example of how using tech with intention has created more equitable opportunities for students. You know, I'll say this, one of the, one of the pieces that I've seen for teachers that has worked in particular is the idea that when students are able to create and design without so much of the formal expectations of 10, 12 size font, Times New Roman, this is the way that it has to look. When we take all those parameters away, um, we start to get better output and better product. One teacher in particular that I had the opportunity to observe, she was utilizing a text in her ELA lesson, and she wanted students to be very expressive when it came to characterization. And as you know, uh, just the old antiquated model of characterization is looking at the dialogue, understanding the theme and mapping, but she used Canva for her students in student groups, which now Canva has an awesome opportunity for students to collaborate um, on the same um, output or presentation or whatnot. She got some of the most beautiful, innovative responses when she put less parameters on necessarily the product and more investment in incubating and curating the idea that with Canva, students had access to photos and videos and all of these different templates so that they could actualize characterization in a way that was meaningful for them. Mm -hmm. Now it also has the opportunity to do voiceovers and things of that nature. My point with all of this is we spend a lot of times when it comes to ed tech tools saying this is what the output looks like. However, if I give Matt a box of cupcake mix and I give Madeline a box of cupcake mix and I take cupcake mix, the fact of the matter is that we could have three different tasting cupcakes based on how Matt measures and how Madeline thinks how many eggs should be in there. And if I put too much vanilla, let's not take the creativity out of intention by saying this is what it must look like and saying instead, this is the vehicle to get you there because what could happen is students could really drive us to new unexplored phases. So more as a facilitator and less as a dictator of what it should look like in the beginning. I think when we use that with intention, we're gonna start to see that our students have deeper learning they ask better questions, and then we don't have to get bogged down in the weeds of the rubric in terms of what that should look like, and instead let our students lead us there. 
I love what you said around really empowering students with that voice and being intentional about it. That's really when the best results uh, show up and also what's meaningful to them because some students, you know, interacting or expressing their knowledge, it varies on what's meaningful to them, uh, whether it's, you know, the multimedia project, an essay, um, having that choice can be really powerful. Okay, so we have time for uh, about one more, one or two more questions. Uh, so we have another question that has just come in. It's many problems are first identified by educators while, they're, while they use the tech or work with students. Can you share an example of how you work collaboratively with everyone in a school to identify problems and work towards solutions? And how do you create a safe space for problem solving around these different challenges? I can, I can start, I think. Um, I'm, I'm going to start by saying that after this is done, I'm going to go buy a cupcake somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> really got me thinking about cupcakes. Um, I, you know, this is maybe not a flashy example, but in our, in our district, what, uh, what we were seeing is we implemented our learning, learning management system. Uh, we use um, Canvas, for example, as that um, there were all different types of teacher uh, teacher usages, and and you would you would expect that, but one of the one of the challenges of that was that it was confusing for students if there was if there was a real um, um, well all over the map how how teachers were presenting their courses and where to look for assignments. And, and so we, um, you know, we kind of created a template in our, our district and that teachers uh, could use. And it isn't that everyone is m marching lock lockstep in their use of the tech tool, mm -hmm. but they're, they're walking in the same direction. And the reason that that is important is organizationally, if you're using a tech tool, across a whole system it's helpful for the student experience to to know um, where to go to to figure out you know how they're going to learn and what they're responsible for so that's an example of a challenge and it's kind of an evolution over time to come to a place where our, our courses looked rel relatively similar so that students could feel more organized and know how to access their learning. Yeah, those are great points. I think, again, the same underlying theme of bringing as many voices as possible uh, to the table when looking at how to identify uh, these challenges and solve for them. That's a fantastic example. So we're coming uh, to, oh, go ahead, go ahead. No, I just wanted to piggyback because Matt, what you just said yeah. was so powerful. And I think, too, as you were talking, I was like, yes. Um, but I mean, also, a lot of times when we think about problems, sometimes what we think is a tech problem is actually a system issue or a policy issue. So I always encourage leaders when they're looking to identify problems, look at the tech. Absolutely. Look at the design pilot with the different groups of individuals, but marry that tech with the other data that matters in your building. So look at the behavioral data. Do you have an increase in suspensions or increase in behavior around a specific time? Look at your physical data. Does your building support this ed tech? Look at your instructional data. If you're looking at a content area, are math scores going up, going down? Are ELA scores going up or down? When you put that together, you're gonna have a holistic picture of not just the tech, but everything that's surrounding it in a school day and in the student experience from time to behavior, to management, to implementation. Love all of these points. Again, looking at the impact from multiple different perspectives, not just you know the tangible academic results. There's so much more to it than that. 
Fantastic point. So we're coming to a close uh, to the session. And I'd love if our panelists uh, in a sentence or two uh, to give your final takeaway uh, to our viewers today. So what would be your one piece of advice uh, to educators and administrators listening on what they should keep um, close as they look ahead into the school uh, year coming up? <laughs> Mine would absolutely be establish your true tech north. When you know where you want to end up at the end of the school year and you define it so clearly that you know what it looks like, sounds like, and feels like, you're going to be better able to navigate students and better able to support teachers to help students get there. Awesome, awesome. I love that concept of True North, and that, I'll just add to that. And I would say, in coming up with your True North, to intentionally figure out how to design your system in a way that magnifies uh, parent experience and student student voice. Wonderful, wonderful. So thank you so much uh, to our panelists uh, for this great discussion today. Uh, we really appreciate all of your expertise, sharing your experiences, and uh, thank you to our viewers uh, for joining us uh, today. Uh, again, as I said at the start, the recording of the session will be made available. Uh, so feel free to share it with your colleagues, anyone uh, from the school. And we also have a uh, ebook that has just come out, which touches upon many of the different areas uh, we discussed today. So thank you again, everyone, and have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you.